All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about continuous annuities. And so, so far the annuities that we have looked at in this course have all had specific payments at specific points in time. And another way to think about this is that we have been looking at practical annuities for situations that could actually happen, right? We were looking at annuities that would make sense in real life scenarios. However, for theoretical purposes, it can be useful to consider continuous annuities or annuities with payments made continuously over a period of time rather than at specific points in time. And so that might seem hard to conceptualize. How do we make a payment continuously? Try not to get too hung up on that because again, this is a theoretical scenario. This isn't something that we can actually do. You cannot make payments continuously, but the question still stands, what if you could? So for example, suppose you had an annuity that continually pays a payment of $1 per payment period and it has an annual effective interest rate of I per payment period. And then let's say that these payments of $1 are made continuously from the present time equals zero to some time in the future T equals N. If we wanted to find the accumulated value of these $1 payments or the future value of those payments from time equals zero to time equals N, it's not going to be possible for us to add up the accumulated values of each continuous payment as we have done for other annuities. However, we can determine the future value at some time N for continuous payments using calculus. And so what we can do is we can actually integrate our accumulation function one plus I to the power of T and integrate it with respect to T from zero to N, and this will give us the accumulated value or the future value at time N of those continuous payments. And so let's find that future value. Let's take this integral and let's solve it. Let's try to find a formula for the future value of a continuous annuity. All right, and so here we have our integral from zero to N of the accumulation factor. And in order to integrate this, remember that we are going to be integrating with respect to T. And so in this case, we have an exponential function, right? We have what would be a constant with respect to T, right? This is just a constant because there's no T's in here, but it's to the power of T. And so how do we take an integral of a constant to the power of the variable of integration? Well, remember, if we have the integral of some constant a to the power of u du, that is equal to one divided by the natural log of the constant a times the constant to the power of u. So we have what we originally started with times one divided by the natural log of that constant. And this could be rewritten to be a to the power of u divided by the natural log of a. And so in this case, if we were to integrate this function, our value of a would be one plus i, and our power is t. And so this will be equal to our constant to the power of the variable of integration. So we're just gonna have one plus i to the power of t in the numerator. And then that will be divided by the natural log of our constant, one plus i. So we'll have the natural log of one plus i. And of course, we're going to be evaluating that from zero to n. And so if we evaluate this for each of those values, this will be equal to one plus i to the power of n divided by the natural log of one plus i minus one plus i to the power of zero divided by the natural log of one plus i. Right, the only place we have a t where we're going to be plugging in our bounds is right here in the numerator. And so we plugged n into the numerator first, and then we subtract plugging zero in for t in the numerator here. And so that's where this zero comes from. And so if we simplify, I'm going to erase this side work here, and we will continue our work up here. This will be equal to one plus i to the power of n, and notice that we have the same denominator here, so we can combine the numerators, and anything to the zero power is one, and so we just have minus one, and then we'll divide by the natural log of one plus i, right? They both have that common denominator, and so we can combine these two fractions to just have one denominator and have this numerator minus this numerator. And so then what do you notice about this formula right here? Well, I want you to take a look at the denominator where we have the natural log of one plus i. And where have we come across the natural log of one plus e interest rate before in the past? Well, if you recall from our lesson on the force of interest, we said that the force of interest was equal to the natural log of one plus i, right? That was the conversion formula to go from an effective annual rate 
to the force of interest or vice versa. And so what we can do here is we can rewrite this formula to be equal to one plus i to the power of n minus one divided by the force of interest. And this right here is going to represent the future value of an annuity with continuous payments of $1. If that amount of $1 was to increase, we would just multiply by whatever that payment amount is, x. But what we have here is a new formula for a new type of annuity. And so this is going to be equal to the future value of a continuous annuity. And so we have a notation to represent that, which will look like this. We're going to have S and then a bar above S, and then we have the number of payment periods N and our interest rate I. And so this is our formula and our notation for the future value of a continuous annuity. And notice that if I were to write down the future value of an annuity immediate, right, that looks like this, we have S and then n and i, and that is equal to one plus i to the power of n minus one divided by i. Notice that the only difference between these two formulas is the denominator, right? For a continuous annuity, the denominator is the force of interest or the natural log of one plus i, but for a standard annuity immediate, the denominator is just i. All right, and so this formula should be pretty easy to remember because it's not too different from a formula that you should already know at this point. But now that we have found the future value of a continuous annuity, the question still stands of, well, what about the present value of a continuous annuity? Well, just like we took the integral from zero to n of the accumulation factor, we can also take the integral from zero to n of the present value factor, and that will give us the same desired result of the present value instead of the future value of a continuous annuity with payments of $1. And so let's do that next. All right, so here we have our integral from zero to n of the present value factor, the power of t. And just a reminder that the present value v to the power of t is equal to one divided by one plus the interest rate to the power of t. And if we're going to integrate this, we're actually going to use the same rule we used for our previous integral. And that is that if you have the integral of some constant a to the power of u du, that is equal to a to the power of u divided by the natural log of a, right? And so in this case, v is going to be our constant. And so we'll have that this is equal to v to the power of t divided by the natural log of v. And that's just v, not v to the power of t, right? Because v would be a in this case. And so we just have the natural log of a or the natural log of v. And then of course, this will be evaluated from zero to n. And so if we go through with that evaluation, we will have that this is equal to v to the power of n divided by the natural log of v minus v to the power of zero divided by the natural log of v. And so then once again, if we want to simplify this, notice that they both have the same denominator of the natural log of v and that this v to the power of zero will just be one because anything to the power of zero is one. And so if we erase this side work up here, we can continue our work and this will be equal to v to the power of n minus one divided by the natural log of v. And now at this point, I'm going to want to simplify this a little bit more. And so I'm going to change this v right here to what the present value factor is actually equal to. And so if I do that, we'll have that this is equal to v to the power of n minus one divided by the natural log of one divided by one plus i. And so now note that one divided by one plus i is the same as one divided by the quantity one plus i, right? That hopefully isn't too hard to see, but we can change this to be equal to one plus i to the negative first power, right? This quantity can be moved to the numerator by giving it a negative power of one, right? So this is the same as this. And so if we rewrite this to be one plus i to the negative first power, we will find an interesting result here. So we'll have that this is equal to v to the power of n minus one divided by the natural log of one plus i to the power of negative one. And now remember a rule about exponents for your term inside the natural log function. We can actually bring that exponent outside and multiply it by the natural log. That is one of the rules of logs. And so what we'll have here, if I erase this work, and once again, we will continue our work up here, that this will be equal to v to the power of n 
minus one divided by negative natural log of one plus i. And so then if we multiply the numerator and the denominator by negative one, we'll have that this is equal to the negative present value factor plus one, right? This became negative and this will become positive divided by the natural log of one plus i. And so then if we rearrange these terms, we'll have that this is equal to one minus the present value factor divided by the natural log of one plus i. And so then we can actually make one more change to this formula, and that is that we can change the denominator to be the force of interest, just like we did for our future value formula. And so finally, this will be equal to one minus v to the power of n divided by the force of interest. And this right here is the present value of a continuous annuity that has payments of $1. And so we actually have a notation for that as well. We have a with a bar, and then n the number of payment periods, and this bracket, and i the interest rate. And so this is the notation and the formula for the present value of a continuous annuity. All right, so now if we look at our formulas here, we have our formula for the future value of a continuous annuity and the present value of a continuous annuity, and we are comparing them to the future value of an annuity immediate and the present value of an annuity immediate. Now we already looked at the difference between the future value formulas, but just briefly, we have the same difference between our present value formulas where the denominator is the only difference in their calculation, right? For a typical annuity immediate, the denominator of that formula is i, the interest rate, but for a continuous annuity, it is the force of interest that we represent with delta. And so since the denominator is the only difference between each of these pairs of formulas, watch what happens if we multiply our formula here for a typical annuity immediate by i divided by delta. And then if we do the same for our present value scenario, we'll multiply by i divided by delta. These i's will cancel out, and so then you'd just be left with delta in the denominator, and so then these formulas would actually be equal to each other, right? So if you multiply your formulas for an annuity immediate by i divided by delta, you then have the formula for a continuous annuity for either the future value or the present value. And so while I wouldn't typically use this formula to calculate the present value or the future value of a continuous annuity, I would rather use these formulas, this is always nice to know in case you need to do a quick conversion for some reason. All right, so hopefully you found this comparison to be helpful. All right, and so let's look at an example problem where we use these formulas for a continuous annuity. All right, so for example, we have an annuity pays $100 continuously throughout the year for 12 years with an annual effective interest rate of 7%. Determine the present value and the future value of the annuity. All right, so we were told outright that these payments are being made continuously throughout each year for 12 years. And so we know we're working with a continuous annuity in this case. And so let's start by determining the present value of this annuity, and then we'll calculate the future value. And so in this case, our payments are $100, so x will equal 100. And then we know that we have 12 payment periods, right? n is going to be equal to 12 because our payments are being made continuously throughout the year for 12 years. So that means that our payment periods are going to be measured in years. And then we also know that we have an effective interest rate of 7%. And so that means that i is equal to 0.07. And so in this case, the present value of a continuous annuity is equal to x, the amount of the payments, times a, and we'll have this bar to signify that this is a continuous annuity, and then the number of payment periods and our interest rate, and so that will be equal to 100 times that notation with n equal to 12, and then our interest rate of 0.07. And so then if we write out the formula for this notation, this will be equal to 100 times one minus the present value factor to the power of 12, divided by the force of interest, which remember is equal to the natural log of one plus i. So we're gonna have the natural log of one plus 0 0.07. And so if we write out what this present value factor is, we'll have that this is equal to 100 times one minus one divided by 1.07 to the power of 12 divided by the natural log of 1.07. And so then if we plug all of this into our calculator, this will be equal to $821.75. That will be the present value of that continuous annuity. But then how about the future value? Well, that's gonna be equal to X, the amount of the payments, 
times this notation, we have S and this bar, and then we're gonna have N, the number of payment periods, and then our interest rate. And so in this case, that will be equal to 100 times that notation, where N is equal to 12, and then I is still 0 0.07. And then if we write out what this notation is equal to, or the formula for that notation, this will be equal to 100 times 1.07, or one plus the interest rate, to the 12th power minus one, divided by the force of interest, right? That would be delta, but we could also just write the natural log of one plus our interest rate, which is going to be 1.07. And so if we plug this into our calculator, we will find that the future value of this continuous annuity is equal to $1,850.75. All right, and so before we end this lesson, there's one more thing we need to look at with regards to continuous annuities. All right, so the last thing that we wanna look at here is I want to recall something about the force of interest, right? So when we had a scenario where we were using the force of interest to accumulate a certain amount over a period of time, or to look at the present value of that amount, we had these two different formulas. We have this formula, which represents the accumulation factor for the future value when your interest is generated with a force of interest delta T. And then we have this formula, which has the present value factor when working with a force of interest. And so if you're not familiar with these formulas, feel free to check out our ninth lesson in this series where we looked at the force of interest more in depth. You can see where these formulas came from, but essentially the most important part of these formulas is this part right here, right over here. This just represents the future value and this is your initial deposit. And then for the present value formula, this is the present value. And this is the amount that you wanna have in the future by making that deposit today, right? And so that would make this the accumulation factor and this is the present value factor. Well, remember how we found the formulas for the continuous annuities. We took the integral from zero to N of the accumulation factor, that was for the future value scenario. And then we took the integral of the present value factor for the present value scenario. And so we could do the same thing in this case. And just a side note, if you're not familiar with this EXP notation, this just means that we have E, the number E, raised to this power of what is inside the parentheses. But anyway, if we were to integrate this accumulation factor and this present value factor, we would then have another equivalent formula that we could use for a continuous annuity if we were given a force of interest, delta T. And so here's what those two formulas will look like. We have that the future value of a continuous annuity with an N number of payment periods and a force of interest, delta T, right? That is going to be your interest rate in this case. That will be equal to the integral from zero to N of E or EXP to the power of the integral from T to N of delta T DT. And then we can't forget DT for our outside integral. And so you'll notice that the bounds of the integral here of our accumulation factor changed. That's just a result of an adjustment to a continuous annuity scenario. And then for the present value of a continuous annuity, we will have A and then that bar and the number of payment periods and delta T as your interest rate. That will be equal to the integral from zero to N of E or EXP to the power of the negative integral from zero to T of delta T dt, and then dt again, right? And so this present value factor matches up pretty closely with what we had up here from our original formula, but you'll notice that this n switched to a t. And once again, that's just a result of adjusting the present value factor to the continuous annuity scenario. And so just know that these formulas can be used in the event that you are given a continuous annuity where the interest is defined with a force of interest delta T. They're not very common problems, but you might come across them. And I'll have some examples where we use these formulas in the examples video that will accompany this video. And so with that, this actually is the end of this lesson. This is all I had for continuous annuities. And if you wanna see those examples, I'll have an example video linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description. And that will have an example of one of the other formulas we looked at. And then we'll have two examples of using these formulas. And so if you wanna see these in action, feel free to check out that video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.